Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day that you have given to us, a day that you have made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Heavenly Father, you have much to tell us in your word about what is coming up in the days and years ahead. And so we pray, Father, that we would be able to see what you have told us, receive it, and then be aware of our surroundings so that we may know what is true and what is false. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, this is actually part two of um, a two-part series. Last week, we considered the deception that is coming to the world. And last week, we spoke of three specific deceptions that are coming. I'm going to review those this morning because, as we say here in Texas, we've all slept since then. Or at least we have sure hoped to have slept since then. And no telling what happens after we sleep. Some things we retain and some things we do not. But we considered the deception or the deceptions that are coming to the earth. The first one that we talked about last week was the deception that there will be those who will proclaim Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus as the true Savior, the true Redeemer, and yet will be deceivers. Now, last week we thought, well, now how is that possible? Well, we have heard this message before. This message is people, preachers, churches, denominations, you know, it, it goes all the way up to the top of some denominations, will be proclaiming Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, but on the other hand, they won't be proclaiming repent. They won't be proclaiming turn your life around. They will be proclaiming you can believe in Jesus and still live however which way you want to live. That is already happening now. That is already happening now. And last week, we uh, heard that such preaching is not biblical. It is not biblical. I mean, if, all you've got to do is go to Romans chapter 6, verse 1, and Paul asks the question, Shall we sin all the more so that grace may abound? And he said, No. It was a resounding no. It can't do that. He says, In Christ we die to sin. So if we are in Christ, how can we go on sinning any longer? We are told in Scripture, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do both. You cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or love the one and hate the other. You know, it just doesn't work. Now there are plenty of people who think you can do both, and it just is not true. That is simply deception. Okay? Now the second one that we looked at last time is God reminds us that the very first deception in the scriptures is going to be the last deception that is going to happen. And that is there will be deception about knowledge. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and the serpent came to Eve, he deceived her by saying, did God say that if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Well, yes, God had said that. But he contradicted God, and he said, you will not die. He said, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he was deceiving them into thinking that God had kept something from them, that he knew something they didn't know. And because of that, the devil goes on to say, eat of it so that you can be like God. Well, of course, God had not been deceiving them. He had, I mean, God is into full disclosure. I'll probably say that several times during the course of today's message. He told them the truth from the very beginning. They didn't need anything anymore, you know, than what God had given them. But the devil was deceiving them into thinking that God had kept something from them. And though they were created to be in the image of God and according to the likeness of God, God, you know, the devil was saying, well, you're really not. But if you have this knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. 
unfortunately, being the deceiver, and there's, you know, being who he is, he was lying. But what we find out is that in the end, we will also be approached by those who will say there is a new knowledge. A new knowledge that adds to the scriptures what we don't already have, something that we need that we don't have. I mean, that was the very first deception in the Christian church in the first century after Jesus rose and ascended into heaven. The people who were perpetuating this lie were Gnostics. Gnostics comes from the Greek word gnosis, which is G-N-O-S-I-S. And so gnosis is the Greek word for to know. And so these people were saying that there is a secret knowledge that a person must have in order to escape this body. That it was the spirit that's good, the body isn't good at all, and so this secret knowledge, you can escape this body. Well, that simply wasn't true. They were trying to say, however, that you know, God could not have come in the flesh. Why would God condescend to that? Because they were saying the flesh is bad. But this knowledge, this superior knowledge was really good. And when you got it, you could escape this fleshly body and be all that you're supposed to be. So this was a special knowledge but, uh, that they were, you know, promoting. But it wasn't new at all. Again, in the end, we'll probably be hit with the same thing, that there will be a knowledge out there that people are to have in order to, you know, go to some other level of, you know, experiencing the divine. Let's call it that. Um, now, we do know that eventually knowledge is going to fill the earth. That's in the scriptures. So knowledge is increasing and increasing and increasing. But we've got to watch what kind of knowledge we take into ourselves. So knowledge, I mean, God is not against knowledge. But when we get, a, you know, if we get knowledge prematurely, or it is not uh, revealed to us from God, but revealed to us from the devil, it's not the right kind of knowledge. And it can do great harm to many people. So... Uh, this new knowledge is probably going to be something along the lines of, you know, gain this knowledge and you'll become a new and improved version of humanity. Uh, and so, no. I mean, God wouldn't have said about his creation, it is very good in the end, if there was something missing. There isn't anything new. But we do know that in the end... In the end, Jesus told us that it'll be like the days of Noah, where people were marrying and being given in marriage. Well, in the days of Noah, one of the things that people don't really like to think about, it nevertheless is biblical, in the days of Noah, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they consorted with them, and they married them, and they had children by them. And these children were the Gibberim, they were the Nephilim, they were the giants, they were half-breeds, they were hybrids, hybrids between people and angels. Now, I can't go into the biology of that. I don't want to go into the biology of that. But Jesus said it'll be that way in the end. That's what he said. That's what he said. And so, I mean, we already know that science is already dabbling into hybrids of different kinds of things. In fact, they're getting really excited about, you know, making us part machine. I don't know. I don't want to be a part machine. That reminds me of Star Trek's Borg. I was like, yuck. It's like, ugh. So anyway, but it's coming because that's what Jesus said is coming. Some kind of hybrid between celestial beings and earth beings, human beings, but that isn't what God designed. So we know that's of the devil. It was of the devil to begin with. It's going to be of the devil the next time around. Now the third deception that we heard about was the old ruse from Joshua chapter 9 about the Gibeonites. 
Now, again, this is just really fantastic kind of uh, knowledge that is coming or that is being revealed right now. But, um, but there are people who are looking forward to uh, aliens being revealed in the earth to be the saviors of the earth. Alien saviors. Well, what God has indeed revealed to us is that it is a ruse, like the Gibeonites pulled on Israel in Joshua chapter 9. And um, what happened then, if you don't know the story, and, and it's all about the Gibeonites, they were some of the people that God told Israel to destroy when they got into the promised land. And Gibeon, they knew they were on the hit list. Okay, so what they decided is they decided to, to, to aim for a ruse and trick Israel into befriending them. And so they pretended to be from a far off country. And so Israel did prevent, befriend them. What Israel had not done, what Joshua didn't do, is they did not seek the wisdom of the Lord. Because the Lord could have said, no, they're, they're your neighbors. And once they did find out that they were the neighbors... And they had already covenanted with them, and once they had covenanted with them, they could not harm them in any way, or else God would come back on Israel and treat them not so good. God does not want us to break covenants. Well, what we find is that these aliens, I mean, I hope you know that angels can take various forms. I mean, they can just appear as various kinds of forms. And so here we're going to have these so-called, you know, alien saviors coming. They're just demons in disguise. They're just right here, already in earth. They're just going to be disclosed as aliens. And, of course, uh, they're not going to be very helpful. Now, they will say they are from a galaxy far, 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 far away. Then they have evolved beyond us already, and they can come and help us how to save, and tell us how to save the planet, and how to get us to move into a higher state of being. That's what the that's what the ruse is going to be. But they're just demons in the skies, and we should be aware of that. Now, I know that you know for some people that's probably like, what? Yeah, I know, but it is amazing the information that is out there that verifies this. And of course, one of the things that we learned last week is that, uh, amazingly enough, the Vatican has a, uh, an observatory. Well, they've got several of them around the world, but one of them is in Mount Graham uh, in Arizona, where they are watching for these creatures to come and looking forward to them. In fact, one bishop or priest has already written a a pamphlet saying the aliens are our friends. They're our brothers. And it's like, what? So I, you know, we just got to stay aware of what's going on. Now this week we've got more areas to look at as far as the possibilities of deceptions, uh, again, from the great deceiver. I mean, he is endless in his, way, in his ways that he can deceive us. And so uh, I consider these particular two uh, sermons as forewarned is forearmed. Okay. Now there are a number of passages to consider. Uh, three of them give us specifics as to deceptions that are coming. Let me read through the verses first and then I'll make some comments. The first one is from Matthew chapter 24 beginning at verse 23. This is Jesus speaking. He says, at that time if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Then from 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning at verse 9, Paul writes, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. 
And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now from Revelation 13, beginning at verse 13, now this passage it concerns the second beast, which is the false prophet, which is the eighth king. Now we've been through this before, but I just wanted to remind you, the second beast is the false prophet, is the eighth king. This is what John writes, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, that is, the first beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, what is the Lord revealing to us in these passages? He says, first, there are going to be false Christs and false prophets. Unlike the first deception that we've already heard once again today, these will indeed be false. They are not going to be proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ of God and then telling people, no, you can live whichever way you want to live. No, these actually will be false Christs and false prophets. So, these are the ones who will you know, either say, you know, point to themselves and say, hey, I'm the man, or they will be prophets of those who are deceivers and who will be saying the same thing. But even though they're going to be saying, hey, I'm the real deal, no, they are not the genuine article. Now, these false Christs and false prophets, they will show great signs and wonders. The purpose of all is which to deceive, okay, to deceive. Paul tells us that all of these are from the devil. The powers and the signs and the lying wonders are meant to deceive. And if you go back and you read the passage that I just mentioned, is that, uh, listen to that, he says, the power signs and lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. Okay, this is aimed at these lying wonders, these signs, these wonders, you know, with all unrighteous deception. They are aimed at those who already do not love the truth. They already are perishing because they don't love the truth. And, you know, if we don't love the truth now, this passage says it is for this reason that God is going to be the one sending them a strong delusion so that they would believe the lie. Eventually, I mean, what this boils down to is, is that you can continue in a life of, you know, delusion and deception and believing lies and hating the truth and so forth, and eventually God will confirm it to you. That's a scary position to be in. Okay? So we really need to pray for people to be able to hear the truth and receive it and believe it and to conform to it and not to all the lies that are out there. Now, John is even told what kind of power, signs, and wonders, lying wonders there will be. And he writes that the second beast, the false prophet, the eighth king, He's going to make fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Now that harkens us back to when Elijah, the prophet of God, challenged the prophets of Baal. Now there were 450 of those, and then the co consorts of those were the 400 asteroids. So there's 850 of them. So one prophet of God versus 850 false prophets, they are... Elijah challenges them. Now, he challenges them because God says, Elijah, this is what I want you to do. Okay? This isn't Elijah's idea. This is God's idea. Elijah says, let's build two altars. Let's sacrifice on both altars. He says, the God who answers by fire is God. Okay? So the prophets of Baal, they do their thing. And uh, they, they work all day, and they work up, and they cut themselves, and they dance, and they scream, and they holler, and, 
and Elijah taunts them because he knows that they're just serving an idol. And nothing happens. Well, when Elijah gets to his altar, it's the altar of God that he has had to repair because it has been in disrepair. He takes the, the sacrifice that is on it. They've had three and a half years of uh, drought, so there's very little water. And so what he does is he, he saturates the altar, the sacrifice, and the wood with water. Well, we all know that, you know, wet wood doesn't burn very well. And yet, he calls out to God, and God immediately answers by fire, licks up the entire sacrifice, the stones, the wood, the sacrifice, and even the water that was in the trough that had run off of the sacrifice. And of course, the response of everybody was, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. This lying false prophet is going to be given the ability to call down fire from heaven. We already know this. So when it happens, we'll know, I ain't the right one. <laughs> Not the right one. It's a counterfeit. Okay? Satan counterfeits everything of God. Now listen to the next counterfeit. Here's another counterfeit. He says, this is what John says, he's even going to cause the idol, the image of the first beast, they call it an image, it is simply an idol, okay, made by man's hands. He's going to cause the idol to speak. In other words, he's going to be able to call breath to come into this image. In other words, it's a counterfeit of God breathing life into people. It's a counterfeit that this image is going to be able to speak and to have breath. However, I think it's important to notice that the idols that uh, Isaiah in particular railed against, that men made with their own hands, they had to be hammered down or nailed down to something or else they would topple over. It does not appear that this idol, that, he's, that this false prophet is going to be able to cause to speak, will be able to move anywhere. So he's just as stationary as the old ones. The difference is he's going to be able to speak and he's going to be able to cause everybody who does not receive the mark of the beast or worship the image of the first beast to be killed. Now here's what's important. Though the enemy is able to kill the body, the one that we are told in the scriptures to be wary of is the one who can kill both soul and body in hell. In other words, we don't have to be afraid if we are threatened with bodily death, we need to hang on to the one that's going to give us eternal life, even if our body is destroyed. So that's what's important for us to remember. So the deception is, of course, to, uh, meant to move people to worship someone or something other than Jesus. That's what all these deceptions are all apart, uh, about. Now, let's remember that uh, it is only possible to counterfeit something if there is the genuine. Okay? There has to be a genuine in order for there to be the counterfeit. So, even though the devil's agents are going to be doing lying signs, wonders, and miracles, God's agents are going to be doing the genuine signs, wonders, and miracles. Okay? Now, how we can tell the difference is Couplefold. First off is, who are they pointing to with these signs, wonders, and miracles? Are they pointing to Jesus Christ? Are they pointing to the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Are they pointing to themselves? Are they pointing to somebody else? Okay? The ones who point to Jesus are the ones who are true. The other thing is that um, who are they pointing to and also what kind of fruit do the people have in their own lives? Jesus said, you're going to know them by their fruit. So the lying, deceptive people. I mean, behind the scenes, their fruit, the fruit of their lives is going to tell them, you know, give them away. Now here's another thing that uh, we need to remember and see in the text is that uh, we are told that, you know, this image that is going to be talking and 
expecting people to worship the first beast, he is going to um, you know, have everybody who is uh, not falling down and worship to the first beast to be killed. Now here is another telltale sign of the enemy, which is there is no freedom. No freedom whatsoever. Okay? A telltale sign of the devil is he's all about bondage and he's all about captivity. Death and destruction follows him everywhere. And that's not the way God is. God is all about freedom. He's all about freedom. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees in the garden. I mean, there were lots of other trees, but there were two trees in the middle of the garden. And one was the tree of life, and the other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And even though we may not like the fact that there were two trees there, God put them there on purpose so that people could have a choice. Okay? And when Adam and Eve chose poorly, God was gracious, kicked them out of the garden so that they could not get back to the tree of life and eat of its fruit and live forever. That would have been worse than anything. That would have been eternal life with no possibility of redemption whatsoever. And so sin would have just kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying throughout the earth with there no possibility of um, relief in sight. So, so there was choice there given to Adam and Eve, and they chose to believe the deception. Now, God continues to offer the world a choice. Adam and Eve, with their one choice, they, they, you know, in a sense, they chose for every one of us. Now, we can't blame them because, see, with Jesus now, God offers every single individual a choice. Though they chose for sin to enter the whole world, now each of us, with the knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, through his life, death, and resurrection. Now each person gets to choose for themselves whom they will serve. Either the God of the scriptures or the God of this world. That's what is before us. Now in the end, the result in the end is going to be everybody who chooses to believe in Jesus will live forever with the Lord. And everyone who does not choose Jesus will live forever separated from the Lord. But the choice is there. Okay? There is no deception in what the consequences of not choosing the Lord will be. There is nothing new. There is nothing, no revelation, no new revelation to be discovered. Like I said earlier, God is into full disclosure. He said right away, if you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. And immediately, the relationship with God that they had, the beautiful relationship that they had, died. They were separated from him. And they looked at each other, and they were naked, and they were afraid, and oh my gosh, all sorts of bad things started happening, and just kept multiplying and multiplying. Of course, now we know how bad it is everywhere. But the Lord made it plain from the beginning what all the consequences were. And so we need to understand that. That there's no new disclosure coming. Everything that he has given to us is true. And it's sufficient. So now, what we have to do, knowing that these deceptions are coming, what we have to do is we've got to continuously seek the truth in the scriptures. What God has revealed from the beginning is true. Okay? No additions needed. What God has said is what he has said. Don't need to add to it, and definitely don't need to subtract from it. Okay? God has told us what's going to happen in the end from the beginning. I mean, that's what makes him God. That he's able to see the whole picture, and he's able to communicate that to us. That's what makes him God. He's able to do that. Um, we also need to check the fruit of anybody who is claiming to be somebody who belongs to you know, uh, this new information or what may be coming, okay? Check out their life. Check out, you know, the fruit of their life. Both true people and false people, check out their life. 
You know, our walk has got to equal our talk. Now, with regard to the message that the faults may be claiming or proclaiming or declaring, who are they pointing to? If they're not pointing to the God of the Bible, they aren't true. Okay? Uh, does what they say line up with the scriptures? It's got to line up. It's got to line up. Now, are they declaring another gospel? Already in Galatians, Paul was talking to the people of Galatia, and he's saying, who has bewitched you? What other gospel has already come in? Have you started in, in faith in Jesus Christ, and, and you want to end with the law? He says, Paul says something just really astounding, and he says, whoever it is that is preaching another gospel, be it me or an angel from heaven, he said, if they're preaching another gospel, let him be eternally accursed. Wow. Those are strong words. Paul wrote what he meant. He declared what he meant. The scripture has declared what God has meant. There is no other gospel. Now, we also need to remember that God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is, and it will always be true. Also, the devil hasn't changed. Okay? He has been the deceiver for a very long time. And he's good at it. He's very good at it. He can disguise himself as an angel of light, but there is no light in him. There's just darkness. He is a liar and he is the father of lies. And he comes to kill and steal and destroy. He is a murderer. God, on the other hand, is love. Pure love. Absolutely pure love. And love is how he continuously relates to us. Always love. The devil is pure hatred. He loves no one. He hates everyone. Death and destruction follow him everywhere. Now, Paul gives Timothy a, uh, a word of advice that I think really we need to take to heart as well. And this is what Paul says. He has talked about how he himself had received persecution. And then he goes on to say, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What the Lord God has given us in the Word of God, in His own Word, it's sufficient, it is enough, it's what we've got to hang on to with all of our might when the deceptions start coming at us full force. Because it is true, God has not kept anything from us. He has given us exactly what we need. Does God know more? Sure, he knows more, but we don't need to know it. So we need to hang on to what we have already received. It is good, and it is true, and it is able to save us. Amen and amen.